John chapter 20. We're drawing pretty close to the end of our study in the book of John. It's taken a little while, a little over a year, but we've got one, maybe two weeks left. I'm praying about whether to cover all of chapter 21 in one message or if we split it up, leaning towards splitting it up, but still praying about that. So we're coming up on the end of our series, but we're going to finish up John 20 this morning. Back in 1991, and I know that's a little ways back, some of you weren't born, some of you weren't thought of, but then others of us, we were around. And some of you may remember back in 1991, it was really, I remember this as kind of the first time news was kind of that 24-7, instantaneous, you saw things on the other side of the world, um, that it was in real time, and that was in Desert Storm. You remember those images? It was all, you know, the night, the nighttime images. It was the green, you know, you're just seeing tracers and you were seeing things in this green hue, this night vision. So if you were alive back then, you, you probably remember some of those images. 10, 11, 12, somewhere in that. I didn't do the math yet. I think it was 12. Um, but I remember those images. Well, back in that time, back in 1991, during uh, Desert Storm, the Army notified one Ruth Billow. That her son, Private Clayton Carpenter, had been killed in action. You, of course, can imagine the heartbreak, the anguish that Ruth went through at the news that her son had been killed. Then a couple days later, you can imagine the confusion, the disbelief, the wonder, when she got a phone call that said, Mom, it's me. It's Clayton. I'm alive. Ms. Dillow said when she was interviewed, it was such a shock. I was afraid somebody was playing with my mind. I began to ask him questions that only he would know the answer to. The Army said in a statement that Carpenter was mistakenly reported as killed in action on February 26th. In fact, Private Carpenter was lightly wounded when a bomblet exploded. He'll be medically evacuated to the United States. The U.S. Army regrets the error. Man, can you imagine what those few days must have been like for Miss Ruth? Those few days of knowing, because the army had told her, knowing that her son was dead. She would never hear him again. She would never see him again. She would never get to give him a hug again. Never hear whatever. Maybe he, maybe he, I don't know much about him. Maybe he was a joker and she thought about those jokes that he would tell or just a certain way he would say mama. Or, and just, just think of the anguish she felt. But then to hear his voice, and even though it was a voice she had heard and she knew, you know, a mom knows that voice. Uh, you, you hear that, you hear 30 kids talking, but you hear your child's voice out of all those. And that's when you call them by all three of their names or four of their names, depending on what family you're in. You call them by all of their names because you heard what they said in the midst of 30 people. Because you, you know that voice. So Ruth just knew she would never hear that voice again. And then she hears it. Mom, it's me. It's Clayton. I'm alive. But she had to ask some questions. She, she had some doubts. How could this be? They told me he was killed. They couldn't have messed that up. How, how could he be talking to me? Is this really my son? And so she started to ask those questions. Okay, well, where did we have your birthday party? You know, whatever the questions were. Where was your, your fifth birthday party? And who was your best friend? And what was the name of our first dog? You, the types of questions you would expect. She started asking these questions that there's no way that he would not know any of these answers. And there's no way someone else would know all of the answers. And so she starts asking the questions until she was sure that this was her son. She wanted to know without a doubt. She wanted to know it was him without a doubt. This morning, that's what I want to talk about, this idea of without a doubt. It, we started in John chapter 20 last week, and we talked about the resurrection of Jesus. And today, we're going we're gonna to look at the disciples' reaction to that. We saw it a little bit last week, but we're going to expand that this morning and talk about it as we finish up John chapter 20. And, and specifically, I want to clear up some what I think might be confusion or fake news or false information about a particular disciple by the name of Thomas. And so let's look at John chapter 20, beginning in verse number 19. John 20, verse 19, the Bible says this, then the same day, all right, the same day what? Real quick, the same day, the same day that Jesus rose from the dead. So then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. 
And when he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side. And then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, so send I you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. As you remit, they are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days... Again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. But then he said to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen has believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. There in that last verse, you see that these are written that ye might believe. And in those of you that have been with us over this last year as we've gone through the book of John, you've seen, I have said it every week, the name of the series, but you might have seen it on the title screen at the beginning. It said that you may believe. And this is where we get that. This, everything that's written in John, everything John had to say, it was so that you might believe on Jesus Christ. And as we get close to the end here, it's still saying, hey, a reminder that you might believe believe. Imagine what the disciples must have been feeling like. We talked about this a little bit last week. The disciples had, some had been there, John had been there, others from a distance had been there, they had seen Jesus die. Like if you ask them some things that they were sure of, some things that they didn't have any doubts about, some things that they were living without a doubt about, if you ask them you know, the number one thing they would say that, that, the day before Jesus rose, tell me something you're absolutely sure of. Well, I'm sure that the one that I've followed for the last three years is dead now. I'm sure that Jesus, the one who worked all those miracles and said all those things and, and just told us he was the only way to the Father, I'm sure that he's dead. John would say, I saw it with my own eye. I was, I, I was there at the foot of the cross. Jesus spoke to me and said, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. He's talking about Mary and John. And, and, and then I was there when he breathed his last. He said, it is finished. And, and he died. I was right there when they put the spear in his side. I, was, I know beyond the shadow of a doubt, without a doubt, Jesus is dead. Mary would have said, I know he's dead. I was there. Thomas, or not, sorry, not Thomas, uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they would, no doubt would have come to the disciples and said, guys, when we took him off, you know, we checked for a pulse just to make sure. We, we listened for a breath just in case. Guys, no, he's, he's gone. It's without a doubt. He's dead. That's what the disciples knew. They knew that Jesus was dead. However, despite what they knew, John tells us in John chapter 20 that a living Jesus appeared in the room to them. A living, they knew he was dead. He did not send them a letter. He didn't make a phone call. Someone didn't come with a, a, a telegram for them. Hey, by the way, Jesus wanted us to let you know he's alive. No, none of that happened. Jesus, who they knew was dead, showed up in their midst. I want, to, I want us to consider this, this idea of without a doubt, how the, the shock they must have felt whenever Jesus was in the flesh, in their midst. So let's look a little deeper in this passage. The first thing I want us to see is the appearance by Jesus. We see that in verses 19 through 21, his initial appearance to the disciples. He, he shows up, uh, again, first time he showed up to the disciples after his resurrection. And it happened on the same day as his resurrection. Man, that was a busy day for Jesus. It was a busy day there because, first of all, he woke up from being dead. I mean, that's, that's a big way to start the day, okay? He rose from the dead. So that starts off, that's how Jesus started his day. He was dead, and now he was alive. 
So he gets up. A little while later, we're told by John that he has a conversation with Mary Magdalene. We're then told that uh, he goes on to the road to Emmaus. He has a conversation with one Cleopas and his companion. And then we're told after this, this travel, after this journey on this road, after the conversation, after revealing himself to Cleopas and Cleopas' companion, that Jesus now enters a closed room. John says the room, the door was the door being shut. Now, it's quite simply, it just means, you know, shut. Like, these doors are all shut. But I think, while it doesn't use the word locked, I, I think they were locked, and they were barred, and they had a chair against it, and they had whatever they could, because it says that they were all there, and they were really, they were hiding out for fear of the Jews. So this wasn't just a door that they just happened to close, that Jesus could have kind of nudged in, got in real quiet, and closed behind him. I think this door was sealed. It was locked. There was, there was no way anyone was getting in without making a big, big uh, uh, ruckus and, and, and knocking things over and coming in. And so here we see in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 21, Jesus appears to his disciples. He didn't knock. Hey, guys, it's me. Let me in. He didn't phone ahead, have the door unlocked. I know y'all got it locked because you're scared of everyone and the Jews and everything, but I'm, I'm on my way. But we just see that suddenly he was there. In this room that was closed, in this room that was most likely locked, it, it, Jesus was there. And, and one, of the, one of the awesome things, you know, when Jesus was here on earth, there were things that, it, because he was 100% man, as well as 100% God, there were times on this earth that, that he would hold back what, as God, he could just do. He would submit himself to, as a man, I'm hungry, so I'll eat. As a man, I'm tired, so I'll rest. As a man, I walk through doors when they're open. I don't just walk through them when they're closed. There were things that Jesus didn't do as a man, but after his resurrection, he says, I mean, he doesn't say, but you can see here this idea that I don't have to worry about any of that anymore. I don't have to turn the knob and open the door and walk through. I'll just be there. I'll just show them my power and just appear in their midst. And when he does that, because think about that, if all the doors are locked and we're gathered around having a meeting or something, all the doors are locked and you know there's no way anyone's getting in, but not someone standing right there at the door. Maybe they slipped in, you didn't hear them, but rather they're standing right there in your midst. And they weren't there a second ago and now they are. That's going to cause you some uh, consternation. That's going to cause you to be a little stressed out. That's going to cause you to have some questions. And so Jesus immediately addresses that when he says, hey, 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 Peace be unto you. It's okay, guys. It's really me. It's okay. It's, it's me. Peace be unto you. We talked a little bit about that last week and how that would have jarred them. Obviously, he's dead, and now he's standing in our midst. Oftentimes, I'll tell you, my, my imagination gets the best of me, and I start imagining that scene. What if he didn't maybe just stand right in the middle of their circle? I mean, remember we talked about this. Was a, the, the time since Jesus had died, this would have been horrible. I mean, there would have been weeping and wailing, quite frankly. There would have been tears just running constantly. There, there would have been, you know, over here there's a group of them just hugging each other, just weeping and, and, and trying to comfort each other when they had no comfort themselves. And how can I comfort you when all I know is Jesus is dead? And, and so whatever was happening, they're in this room together. They've been mourning now. Now there's this story they're hearing Mary saying, no, seriously, uh, first she said the tomb's empty. Peter and John went and they're like, we can confirm the, the tomb is empty. And then Mary comes back like, no, wait, yes, it's empty, but it's not because they stole his body. He's alive. I've seen him. So now this story, so now they're, they're that night, the same day, it's in the evening, the same day Jesus rose from the dead. They're gathered in that room. Maybe they're questioning Mary. Mary, for real. Okay, what did you see? What did he say? Where was he? Are you sure it wasn't just someone that looked like Jesus? Are you sure? Hey, maybe they were questioning him. And maybe they're over here having conversations. I'm, I don't know, man. I mean, you know Jesus cast out those demons out of Mary. Are they back? Maybe she's lost her mind because demons have moved back. I mean, these are the things that you would have wondered. Because you knew Jesus was dead. You'd seen him. You'd seen him taken from the cross. Several had. Put in the tomb. You heard by those that physically touched him. He was dead. So imagine they're all kind of maybe a little huddle over here talking. Another huddle. But what if she's right? What if he really is alive? What are we supposed to do? Where, where do we go? Where are we going to meet him? What, and I'm sure they had questions. And yeah, here's what my imagination gets the best of me. I imagine maybe one of them. You know, if it were in our setting, there's a coffee pot over in the corner. And like, I, just, I don't understand. I, 
I gotta get some more coffee. You want anything? And walking over there and saying, excuse me, Jesus, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. And then stop and say, wait a second, Jesus? Jesus, who wasn't there two seconds ago, now just standing in the room. Can you imagine? Because they knew without a doubt he was dead, but now there he is. As he appears to the disciples, man, that, I bet the scene changed a little bit when that happened. I, I bet the scene, the whole spirit of the room, the whole demeanor of the disciples changed a little bit when Jesus just showed up. What you guys talking about? What's going on? I, I, these are questions that, you know, I imagine him saying, of course, it's not recorded here, so I'm adding a little here. But like, you know, just heard any good news lately? <laughs> and like, man, I just that scene when he shows up to the disciples. Peace be unto you. Hey, guys. Yeah, it's really me. Mary wasn't lying. Mary's not confused. She was telling you the truth, guys. Here I am. And it says that he, to his disciples, he reached out his hands so they could see the nail prints. He pulled back his robe, showed them his side so they could see where the spear had gone in at his crucifixion. He said, it's me. They, stood, they saw his face. They heard his voice. And then he showed them, it really is me. Peace be unto you. I mean, all the turmoil you've been in for the last few days, peace be unto you. And what a scene that must have been. I, I mean, I, I imagine their hearts just pounding out of their chest at the sight of Jesus and not, I mean, I, I don't, you imagine this, 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 this roar goes up from all of them talking at once, but I don't know if it did. Maybe it was just the most silent silence you ever heard because now the one they knew was dead is standing there. And what do you say to that? What, what do you say? And they just stood there with their mouths open and looked at Jesus. And he said, peace be unto you. What a sight that must have been. Jesus had risen from the dead and he was showing himself to the disciples. But he was showing himself to most of the disciples. There were 10 of them there. You know, when we think about the disciples, we think about Jesus' 12 disciples. Of course, there were two that were missing. One was Judas Iscariot. And we talked about Judas a few weeks back. Judas Iscariot is the one that betrayed Jesus. And we're told in the Gospels that after he did, he kind of had a change of heart, not a change of heart towards Christ. It's not that he placed his faith in Christ and got saved. And no, he just felt guilty. He's like, all right, I messed up. And he tried to give the money back. And the, the Jewish religious leaders, we don't, we don't want that. You, you take it. We, don't, we can't take that blood money. And we're told that G Judas went out and he killed himself. Judas wasn't there, obviously. But we're also told another one wasn't there, and his name was Thomas. So two, two of the disciples were missing. So there were ten disciples in that room that just witnessed the resurrected Jesus. So that's his first appearance, the appearance by Jesus. But then, let's, here's where we're going to spend most of our time as we shift gears. So that's the ten that got to see him. That's the ten that he showed up to first. But if we're going to talk about a sermon and we're just going to say, hey, without a doubt, then I think we've got to shift gears and we've got to talk about somebody else. Let's talk about Thomas a little bit. Uh, let's see the apprehension of Thomas. He, was, he, he, he had some questions, if you will. I mean, imagine being Thomas that night. I, we don't know why he wasn't there. Maybe, maybe they were running low on food and they're like, Thomas, listen, you know, your cousin owns that little deli down the road. Will you go and get some sandwiches for us? Grab some drinks, grab some things, and, and we got to eat. You know, we're mourning, we're, we're sad, but it's, maybe it had been a few days since they'd eaten. Again, I'm just, my imagination here. So he goes out, goes out to get food maybe, goes out to get some groceries again if, it's a, if we were to modernize a little bit. And I, I, can, I can see Thomas coming back in, you know, he's got his arms full of sandwiches or drinks or whatever. He's got it, so he's backing into the door, you know, maybe it's locked. So he kind of knocks it with his heel. They open it, the guys, it's Thomas, and they open it, he comes in and, He's like, no, guys, I'm good. Thanks. You know, I'll take care of all the groceries myself. Don't worry about helping me. I mean, y'all just stand down with, with your mouths hanging open, looking at me and that, whatever. I got this guy. Besides, I mean, I doubt y'all could have carried all this anyway. You know, I'm Thomas. I got this. And so he shows up and then they're like, you, you ever showed up somewhere and you look around like, what's going on? Like, y'all, did something happen? Like, whether it's excitedness or, or sadness, you know, you walk into a room and like either some really bad news has just happened. You can tell, I mean, something's happened. What's happened? Who is it? What's, who's been hurt? Who's been killed? Or you walk in and everyone's just like over the moon excited. And you're like, what did I miss? What, what, what did I miss? Like, what, what's happened? 
Maybe, maybe you were supposed to be at a party at a certain time and you didn't know that it was a party, someone revealing, you know, hey, we're expecting and it's a first grandchild on this side of the family or whatever. And, and you showed up five minutes late and everyone's like, oh, this is so awesome. They're hugging and everything. And you're like, what is it? You know, what did I miss? And Thomas was walking in on something and he knew, I, I got to imagine, he knew he had missed out on something. Walking in with his groceries or whatever and like, what's going on, guys? Why, why are y'all so happy? Like, because we've just spent the whole weekend mourning. Why, why are y'all so happy? But Thomas, one of the people called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. Jesus was here. Jesus, you just missed Jesus. Oh man, if you had only been here five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago, if you had only been here, you would have seen Jesus. Is that not funny? Jesus is dead. Well, why would you think that's something funny to say? Now seriously, everything Mary told us this morning, it's true, he's alive. He showed up, the door was shut, the door was locked, just like when you came and you had to kick the door because we weren't open and your arms were full and we had to unlock it so you could come in. Jesus, the doors were locked. He didn't knock though, he, just, he was just here. He was just suddenly in our midst. Okay, guys. Okay, fine. Okay, Jesus is alive. Okay, fine. I want to see him too. And you know what? Unless I see the nail prints in his hands, unless I see the hole in his side, unless I can reach out and touch him, I'm not going to believe it. And because of that, because of something that was said 2,000 years ago, Thomas has a nickname. Real quick, I think most of you know it. So let's all play a little game and say it all together on the count of three. What's Thomas's nickname? One, two, three. Yeah. Doubting Thomas. There may be somebody in here that didn't know that. Maybe you've not been in the Bible or in church much, and that's fine. But for those of us who have really not even a lot of knowledge, a little bit of knowledge about certain things, we've all heard Doubting Thomas. Maybe you've heard the term Doubting Thomas and you didn't know why that was even a thing. You didn't know it was about a real person in the Bible. You just heard someone say, oh, you're a real Doubting Thomas, aren't you? And you're like, oh, that's Bible? Like, I just thought it was a thing. I didn't know that was really someone's name was Thomas. And they, but you know, he's been called Doubting Thomas because of this happened. Thomas. He's mentioned 12 times. 12 times by name is Thomas. Uh, 12 times, 5 times he's mentioned in this passage by name. 5 times he's mentioned in just a listing of the disciples. There was Peter, and there was Judas, and there was Thomas. And then there's two other times he's mentioned in different places. At the last time Thomas said, let us even go with him to die. Like Jesus is mourning, Jesus is hurting, his friend Lazarus is dead. Let's, let's go and mourn with him. Let's go, I mean, Jesus is dying a little bit on the inside because his buddy Lazarus is dead. Let's go and mourn with him. Let's go and die with him. That was Thomas. Thomas also said, how are we supposed to know what's happening here? You, what, he had questions. So 12 times Thomas has mentioned, we don't know a lot about Thomas. But yet, for the little bit we know about him, doubting Thomas. For 2,000 years, doubting Thomas. Thomas. Some years ago, as I was reading this passage, it kind of struck me. And I kind of, it's one of those things. God may change my mind. At some point, but kind of what I was struck by a few years ago is that I don't think Thomas was doubting God. I don't think that Thomas was doubting Jesus. I think Thomas, more than anything, was doubting the other disciples. I, I, mean, I want you to consider this. These were the same disciples that did not understand that Jesus was going to die and raise again on the third day, even though he had told them repeatedly, just like Thomas. These were the same disciples that fled when Jesus was arrested, just like Thomas. These were the same disciples that were in hiding for fear of the Jews, just like Thomas. These were also the same disciples that doubted the resurrection of Jesus when Mary Magdalene came and told them that she had encountered Jesus. As a matter of fact, in Mark's gospel, we read this, Mark's gospel 16, verses 9 through 11, it says this, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him. And they mourned and wept. Remember I talked about the scene there. Mourning, weeping. They're still on the third day, mourning, weeping. She went and told them as they mourned and wept 
And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, last two words in the verse say this, believed not. Just like Thomas. None of the disciples believed it when Mary came to them. So why weren't any of them labeled doubting? Doubting Bartholomew. Doubting Andrew. Doubting John. Doubting James. Doubting Peter. Actually, doubting Peter would fit. More than even Thomas. Over in Matthew chapter 14, we spoke about this passage a couple weeks ago on a Wednesday night. This is the passage, Matthew 14. It's where Peter walked on water until he didn't. And remember, he, he, he took his eyes off Jesus and he took, put his eyes on the storm. And what happened? He began to sing and he called out, Lord, save me. And what is Jesus' response to that? And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Why not doubting Peter? He earned the title. Jesus looked at him and said, why are you doubting? Doubting Peter. But that's not the case. It's doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas who knew that Jesus was dead. Just like all the other disciples knew that he was dead. The other disciples had the benefit of seeing a risen Savior. Who they did not believe was risen until they saw him. Remember, we saw it last week and we read it again a few minutes ago. When they saw him, they were glad. Didn't matter what Mary said. Nope. Didn't matter John and, and, and Peter had seen an empty tomb. Nope. He's been stolen. And then when they saw Jesus, they were glad. But Thomas doesn't get that benefit. Oh, doubting Thomas, unwilling to believe, doesn't have any faith, doubting Thomas. Matthew also tells us even after the disciples saw Jesus, there were still some that had their doubts. Matthew 28, 17 says this, And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And yet Thomas is the only one who's been labeled as a doubter. I think he doubted the disciples. Come on, guys. You're no better than me. You, you saw the same thing I saw. You believe the same thing I believe. You, you had your doubts just like I did. I, I don't believe your story that you saw Jesus unless I see him like you saw him. I don't think that Thomas wanted to doubt. He wanted to believe. He had just given three plus years of his life following Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the one, the only one that can take us to the Father. Jesus, look at the miracles we've seen, the teachings we've heard. I want Jesus to be alive, guys, but I saw him. He was dead. He wanted Jesus to be alive. He wanted to believe, but he had questions. The other disciples believed it because they saw it. And he just wanted the Look back at our text, verse 26. First four words. And after eight days. If he had doubts on day one, what do you think it was feeling like on day six and seven on into day eight? Okay, guys, so really. <laughs> All right, tell me again. Jesus rose from the dead that morning. He did some stuff during the day. We're piecing that together still, right? And then that night, he shows up to you jokers, you doubters out there. He shows up to y'all and says, guys, I'm alive. And then he leaves right before I come back with your dinner, right? And right before, and I show back up and you're like, oh, you just missed him. Ha ha ha. Imagine day five, six, seven. Like, guys, this is serious. It's not funny. Like, if he showed up to you, then why is it day five and I haven't seen him? Why is it day six and I haven't seen him? Why is it day seven and every day? Really, guys, when, when are you going to tell me the truth? Is it today you're going to come clean? Or, or is this just something you're just going to, you've gotten this far into the lie, you've got to keep telling the lie? Can you imagine how frustrated he must have been? And after eight days... I'm sure the questions he had, the doubts he may have had, were very strong after they said on the resurrection day they'd seen Jesus. And in eight days, he had not yet seen Jesus. Based on John's account, as we read here, I think that visit on the eighth day was very targeted. Jesus showed up again. The doors were shut. We can assume locked, barred, you know, things stacked in front of him again. Because still, though Jesus was alive, 
they were still wanted men. They still were uh, persona non grata with the, the Jewish rulers. And so they probably still had to kind of keep a low profile, even though they knew Jesus was alive because Jesus wasn't making it widely known to all the religious rulers. Okay, we need to kind of stick together and be quiet. So again, they're in this shut room. And now on the eighth day, after, the, after eight days, on this eighth day, now they're there. And Thomas is like, seriously, guys, it's, it's old now. I mean, no, it's, it's actually beyond old. Right, Jesus? I mean, these guys have been telling me for eight days that, uh, hmm, Jesus. Jesus made a specific visit for a specific purpose. And that was, hey, Thomas. Here are my hands. Here's my side. Come touch. It's me in the flesh. It's interesting whenever Jesus specific, specifically comes and says to Thomas, here are my hands, here's my side, come touch them, feel them, it's me. Thomas had said, unless I see and unless I touch, I won't believe. Jesus wasn't in the room when he said that. But of course, Jesus, with all power, he knew what Thomas needed. He knew what, what Thomas required to have any doubts removed. And so he said, here, touch me. What's Thomas's response in seeing Jesus alive? Eight days he's heard about it. Now, finally, with his own eyes, he's able to see Jesus. He says in verse 28, my Lord and my God. What a simple declaration, but what a deep and profound declaration. He didn't go into Jesus. I can't believe you're here. These guys have been telling me for eight days that you weren't going to cut, that you were alive. And I'm like, where is he? If he's, if he's alive, why isn't he showing himself to me? And man, I was so frustrated and I was so upset. And I can't believe you're finally here. No, 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 no. There's none of that. My Lord and my God. I mean, so much power. There's nobody. There's nobody that could get up out of the grave but my God. There's nobody that could be standing here in the flesh right now after all that I saw you go through. There's no way but my Lord and my God. How I think as powerful as it was when Jesus showed up to the ten. One moment between Thomas, between Jesus. How impactful. That must have been, as Thomas just says in response, my Lord. Jesus. For 2,000 years, we call him dying Thomas. We get a nickname. Sometimes that nickname sticks even when it doesn't make sense. Maybe you were, maybe you were late at your growth spurt. Maybe you picked up a nickname half the size of everyone else but then you hit your growth spurt and now you're a foot and a half taller than everyone else and they still call you tiny it's an ironic nickname you know but we still called thomas doubting thomas like ugh, a guy who was always doubting things i'll even joke when i'm preaching like i did a little while ago like i doubt y'all could even help me carry this stuff i'll even joke about thomas and use doubt whenever i can you know you know he said i doubt y'all two thousand years we called him doubting thomas when he saw jesus he was done doubting he was done. When he had the same eyewitness account, the same eyewitness experience, if you will, as the other disciples, he was done. He was done with his doubts. Here's what tradition tells us about Thomas. Thomas, who had seen the risen Lord, he went out. And, you know, at different times, the different disciples scattered to different places, and they took the gospel to different areas, which is what Jesus told them to do. He's like, you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be witnesses unto me into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. In other words, he's like, don't just stay here and talk about me. Go everywhere. And we read in Acts, we see that uh, when persecution came upon the church, because they were kind of staying close to home in Jerusalem, but then persecution came and they started to scatter. And that's when the gospel really took off. When, when, when the disciples and others scattered because of persecution. You know what we find out about Thomas? Again, this is tradition. It's not in Scripture. We don't have this much of a story. But tradition tells us that Thomas went towards India and preached all along the way. Telling about Jesus and that I, I've seen him, he's alive. 
At, at first, I had questions because you got to know these other disciples. I mean, these guys are jokers and these guys aren't trustworthy. And, and, and I mean, you know, they had doubts and I had doubts. And then, then suddenly they're like, nope, he's alive. Okay, so for, for a few days, I was still questioning. But then I saw Jesus and I saw his scars and I, I saw the nail prints. I saw the spear, the hole in his side. And, and I no longer had any doubts. So he's preaching all the way to India and people are being converted. And then, time, again, based on tradition, there comes a time. Somebody obviously didn't want to hear it because Thomas dies a martyr's death impaled by a spear. You don't subject yourself to that if you don't believe. You don't subject yourself to that if there's still any kind of doubt in the back of your mind. Maybe it was a illusion. Maybe it was a mirage. Maybe they had someone stand in and it just looked like Jesus. Maybe, maybe, maybe. You don't say, I'm willing to die for the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if you don't think he's risen. Doubting Thomas. It doesn't make sense anymore. He doubted for a moment. Why 2,000 years later are we calling him still doubting? The appearance of Jesus this afternoon. Wrap this up. I want us to see the applause of Jesus. The applause rebuke of Thomas and how dare you I can't believe the word doubts never used doubting Thomas but Jesus never says doubt remember back Peter why did you doubt he actually said Peter doubted but we don't say doubting Peter doubting Thomas Tom, he, he doesn't come in Thomas they told you I was alive why didn't you believe these guys you know they're all trustworthy you know they would stand they wouldn't flee they wouldn't hide no no he doesn't he doesn't give him a hard time about all that we, we, we really, there's not a strong rebuke. He does say, why? Or he says, don't be faithless, but believing. I don't see it so much as a rebuke, as an encouragement, a challenge. Hey, you've been struggling with your faith. You've had some doubts. Doubts aside, it's time to set the faith aside it's time to the faith that you need to believe that i'm alive you said all you, you you had your doubts about it and now here i am stop being faithless only believe there i see an encouragement to be faithful but what i do see i see a praise from jesus verse 29 Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Statement of fact. Here's where I see this applause from Jesus, this praise from Jesus. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas, you believe because you've seen me. Okay, you know what? Your doubts are taken care of now. Let's set it aside. Let's move forward. Be faithful going forward. Believe and be faithful and minister and see people saved. And but then there's this praise. Jesus throws out there this applause. All right, Thomas, that's you. But you know what? Let's not talk about you for a second. Oh, man. There's going to come some people. They're not going to see me. But they're going to hear the gospel. They're going to read my word as Paul writes it and Peter writes it and Luke and different ones are going to write it. And they're going to hear my word. Whether somebody comes to them and says, let me tell you about my Jesus, as the song says. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And they're going to talk about Jesus who died, was buried, and on the third day rose again. And you know what? They're going to believe, having never seen me, they're going to believe by faith. Those people, man, they get a standing ovation by me. They are going to receive praise. They're going to receive applause. I'm going to be like, that's the kind of people I need. Those people that walk by faith, having never seen me, whoosh, mm, that's, that's exciting. In other words... Every single person here who's ever placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's who Jesus was talking about. Those people sitting in Gaskin First Baptist Church in February of 2023, having never seen me standing there showing them my, 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 my nail prints and the spear hole, having never seen me, and they yet say, my Lord and my God, the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who saved me from my sins. Oh, man, I can't wait to see him someday. But even though I haven't seen him, oh, I know he's real. And I've believed, I've placed my faith in him. Jesus says, well done. Well done. You're better off than the disciples, all of them, because all of them had to see it to believe it. 
So I see an applause from Jesus. Paul said over in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, says, We walk by faith and not by sight. In the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 11, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith says, I believe it, even if I haven't yet seen it. I believe it, even if I haven't seen it. Both of those passages, Paul writing in 2 Corinthians and, and the writer of Hebrews writing in Hebrews 11, go right along with our text here in Jesus saying, Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Some would say seeing is believing. Jesus, as we've said before, says believing. Having faith is believing without seeing. As we talk about Thomas, we, we label him with doubting and we act like that's such a horrible thing. Can't believe he had doubts. We can't believe he had these questions. Can I just tell you today, if you've got doubts, if you've got questions, it's okay. Doubting does not make you a bad Christian. Doubting does not make you someone that can never be used by God. We you know what doubting makes you? Simply, human. Have you ever had someone tell you a story? Let's say, just step away from the Bible for a second. Any story. And you're like, yeah, that's too hard. That, that's too much. That's, there's no way I'm going to believe that. Prove it. Or maybe you suddenly act like you're from Missouri and you're like, show me. You know, I won't believe it until you show. You ever had that about anything? Did that make you like a less, less of a person because you needed proof? Nobody that stands up to try a case in a courtroom is like, listen, I don't have evidence. Just trust me. This is what happened. They're guilty. No, they have to have evidence, proof. No one looks at them and like, can't believe you have questions, but you haven't witnessed all of it. Sometimes we talk about folks that say they're believers, but then they've got questions. They're like, I can't believe. You don't just believe everything. You just, just let go of all your questions and just cancel all of your doubts and just let go of all of that. Listen, having doubts is just part of being human. Jesus says, have faith. Don't doubt. He's not saying you're so horrible for doubting. He's saying, work through those and have faith. You have doubts, you have questions, ask the questions. Listen, God can handle your questions. I promise you are not smart enough to come up with a question that God doesn't have an answer for. Now, it doesn't mean he has to give you the answer, but there's nothing you're going to ask him. And he's going to sit there and be like, give me a few days. I got to talk to some folks because I don't know the answer to that one. Doubting is okay. We all have doubts from, one time, from uh, time to time. We all have doubts. We're called to believe. Walk by faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of, not, of things not seen. But we're going to have times of doubt. What do you do, though, with those doubts? What do you do when you have those questions? Do you just sit back and, well, obviously God's not true. God's not real. Jesus didn't raise. Because I have questions. So obviously all that stuff isn't real. It's not what we do. If you have questions, if you have doubts, look for the answers. Look for the answers. Well, what did Paul mean when he said such as that just doesn't I don't understand that. It doesn't make sense to me. Was that even real? What did Jesus mean when he said this in his teachings? What did look it up? Dig in. If I came to you and told you something about a particular athlete and you're like, I don't know if that's right. You know what you do? You go Google it. Find out about him. Did they really do that? Is that really a stat? That's an unbelievable stat. I, I need to go look at it for myself. Sometimes Nikki and I will be having a conversation and she'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, that was so-and-so that was that actor that was in that thing. And I'm like, I doubt it. <laughs> I'm going to go to the Google. We're not even worried with Google. Don't worry. Let's change the subject. That's after I've seen that she was right. I'm like, what did it say? Nothing. Don't worry about it. It's broken. Google's down today. Sorry. If we have doubts, we Google it. But it seems like in our faith, if we have questions, if we have doubts, sometimes we just shut down. If you've got questions, seek answers. Ask somebody. Look into God's word. If you have doubts, it doesn't make you a bad person or a bad Christian. It makes you human. There's two things, uh, there are two words that are used at different times. There's doubt and there's unbelief. And they're not the same thing. 
You see, unbelief says, I don't think it's true and I'm unwilling to change my mind on this. Doubt says, I want this to be true, but I'm not sure. I've got questions. Unbelief causes us to question. Doubt leads us to ask questions. Now, those seem very similar, but if you're a parent, you know there's a difference. Uh, questioning versus asking a question. In other words, I need you to clean your room. Why should I clean my room? Is that asking a question or is that questioning? That's questioning. That's putting your authority to the test. That's saying, who are you to tell me what to do? <laughs> well, we're about to find out. <laughs> You see, there's a difference in questioning versus asking, wait, go clean your room. Um, did you want me to put those clothes in the dresser or just all over the bed? Which would you like me to do? That's asking a question. It's a dumb one, but that's asking a question. <laughs> Unbelief questions. Doubt. Ask questions. It's okay to doubt. If you place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're walking around, I... We've all at different times had our doubts. But what we've got to do is just take, as I say all the time when I talk about faith, take that what? Next step. A few weeks ago, Brother Bobby spoke on that. Brother, Brother Bobby Collins on Wednesday night talked about taking our next step. He preached basically the entire book of Joshua in one message talking about take your next step. You may be struggling. You have your doubts. And you're like, God, I don't know where this is leading. It feels like maybe I'm going the wrong direction. It feels like this is leading nowhere, God. I doubt this is the right way. Is it? Just take the next step. All right, God. I don't know this is going to work out, but I will walk by faith, even though I don't see where it's going. I may have my doubts, but I'm going to take the step. Good. Take the next one. I just, I still don't know, God. Are you sure? Because do you know what you're talking Take the next one. And we walk by faith. We walk with our doubts. We walk through our doubts. We walk until we don't have those doubts anymore. We keep walking by faith. Maybe the Lord's speaking to you about doing something right now. You, you're like, I think it's God, but I've got my doubts. Go to his word. What's it say? Ask somebody for counsel. Ask somebody to help you pray about it. Maybe it's just not time for you to know the answer yet. So you're like, I doubt this is it. But God's saying, just trust me. You'll understand soon. You'll understand in a minute that this is what I've called you to. This is what I have for you. Just walk by faith. Listen, we can walk out our faith and at some point be living a life without a doubt. But it requires that we walk by faith. But then there's a different group. Those are for maybe you're a believer and you're struggling with doubts and you feel bad because there are times that you have doubts. But then there's another group. Maybe there's somebody here today. They've never placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You've never started that relationship with Jesus Christ. What's holding you back? You got some doubts. You got some questions. Why would Jesus, who's never even met me, die in my place? How could God love somebody like me? But did God, okay, so if God loves the whole world and Jesus died, does that mean God sent Jesus to die for murderers? What about those who hurt children? Like, I don't understand. How could God love them like that? Do I want him to save me if he's willing to save them too? And maybe you have questions and that's okay. Take them to him. You say, I've never started a relationship with him because I got questions, I got doubts. That's okay. Take them to him. Read his word. Ask somebody who you know is a Christian. Ask them to talk to you and explain some things. Doesn't mean they're going to have all the answers for you. But at some point when you look at the evidence that God loves you, he loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for you. The Bible says that not only did he die, he was buried, but he didn't stay there. He rose again. The disciples and, and we're told, I think Paul says something like some 500 different people ended up witnessing the resurrected Jesus in the weeks before he ascended back to the father. And Paul says in his writings, he's like, some of them are still here. <laughs> you remember. You remember when we saw Jesus? So did you. Yeah. They're still here. They, they remember. They'll tell you. Listen, God loves you. He loves you, questions and all, doubts and all. He loves you. And he wants to adopt you into his family. He wants to, to save you. Maybe your problem isn't God's willing to save those people. Maybe that's not your problem. Maybe your problem is I don't think he could save me because I'm the bad person. I've done too much. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever. You know that word means whosoever? All of us. No matter how good you think you are, but you're not. No matter how bad you are, which you probably are. God loves you. So that whosoever comes to him can have forgiveness and have eternal life. If that's you today, you've had your questions, you've had your doubts, so you've never given your life to Christ, I would love to talk to you and show you from God's word how that you can know you can have a home in heaven. You can come in a few moments in the invitation. We can chat. We can chat after the service where we'll have more time, more privacy. And I would love to tell you and show you from God's word how you can know that you can be a child of God. Listen, we all have our doubts at times, but I'll say to you in closing what Jesus said to Thomas. Be not faithless, but believing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you. We thank you for loving Thomas, showing yourself to Thomas, even though a lot of us will look at it and say, oh, that doubting Thomas. There's old Thomas didn't believe, even though Jesus rose, even though none of them believed, none of the disciples believed until they saw you. Lord, we, we pray for those today that have those kinds of doubts. Maybe they, maybe they identify with the name Doubting Thomas, and that's why they keep calling that, because they know, I'm, well, I'm doubting David, or I'm doubting Bob, or I'm doubting... Maybe that's why we keep calling him Doubting Thomas, because we can identify with someone who's got doubts. Lord, whoever it is today, they've got their doubts, they've got their questions. May they bring those to you. May they submit to you and your leading and your, your call to walk by faith. And maybe they don't get all the answers right now, but they just say, you know what? I, I still have my questions. I still have my doubts, but the Lord's telling me to take this next step of faith. And so I'm just going to do it. And I'm just going to trust that someday, maybe not be tomorrow, may not be next year, may not be 10 years from now, but someday the Lord's going to take care of my doubts and he's going to answer those questions I have. I'm just going to trust him. May that be what each of us do. And for the one maybe that is here today that's never placed their faith in Jesus Christ, doesn't matter how young they are, how old they are, they've, they've been living this life apart from Christ. Maybe they're a great person, they're super nice, they treat everyone well, but they've never given their life to Christ. Maybe they're an awful person. They're the kind of person you avoid if you see them coming down the street. Doesn't matter. You die for all. You died to save all of us from our sins, so may today be the day that they recognize Regardless of what questions or doubts they have, you are the one that has the answers. You are the only one that can save them and provide them a home in heaven. You are the only one that can welcome them into your family. May today, something that's been said, speak to them. May you draw them by your spirit to your son. Lord, we just pray that you would have your will and way in this service, the remainder of it, in this invitation, everything that's done, just speak to hearts. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.